So in 18 months, I went from no social following beyond friends and family to about half a million followers on social media. And then in 24 months, which is where I'm at now since starting that, it's now become just a significant part of my life. And in this video, I'm gonna talk a lot about why I feel creators should be creating and then give a really tactical guidelines of how you actually do it from how I record all of my videos, how I use green screen, how I edit, what networks I post on and why, scripts and formats that I feel are impactful to actually make a difference, how I plan my content, write my content, publish my content, and then some narrative about why it's important inside a creative career to do this and what leverage that gives you, because it's really about leverage. And I'm gonna start there because I started making content mainly because I felt out of touch. I was a former marketing leader. My last job was really operational. I was a president of about a 200 person company. I was dealing with distribution, with sales, with trucking, with retail stores. After that, I was like, hey, I wanna get back to marketing, back to design. And then I realized I didn't understand what was going on. And I like to be just dangerous enough at everything to be able to successfully manage someone at it and understand the expectations I have of them, what I'm asking them. So I decided to make content. And I had JT Barnett in my phone, on my feed saying, everyone should be a creator. And I saw it enough. And it resonated enough that I was like, you know what, I'll try this. But something funny happened. And it's the main reason I'm calling this out inside a video to my community, which is mainly creative people and entrepreneurial people, is how the dynamic shifted. So when I developed a little bit of a following, 20,000, 30,000 on TikTok, that took about six months. Meetings started to change. All of a sudden, people started asking my opinion on social media, even people that I thought were savvier than me, but who didn't have their own followings. At 50,000 followers, I was the authority inside the meetings, internally on the projects I was working on. At 100,000 followers, I was making money. And then at 100 plus, the whole dynamic started to shift in conversations externally too. So at that time, I was working with a business that had a lot of retail sales. We were in Costco, we were in Walmart, we were in Target. And we started to get in these conversations where I would be in a meeting or be in a retail meeting and additional members of their team would like ask to join because they wanted to meet me because they were fans of my content about marketing and branding. And then that's a whole nother dynamic shift because then when you present a marketing plan or some sort of combined initiative, people are really excited about it because there's someone that they respect that's behind it. And that's when I realized that this has a lot more legs than just me understanding how to manage teams that do it or me getting extra money from doing brand deals. This is actually a shift in being able to get my creative ideas executed and be able to help brands actually do what they're supposed to that I'm working on versus get caught in this endless argument of, is this creative idea gonna work? Is this good enough? Why should we do social media? And that's where it comes down to you because I get a lot of comments on this channel of people that work on different teams who are like, I have the vision, but I can't get it across. And the number one thing you can do to get you there is to just develop an audience that gives you enough credibility so you can push back on those ideas. And so that people who look you up go, or when you're not in the room, they go, hey, you know that girl has 100,000 on social media or 40,000 on social media? And it's just crazy how much of an impact that that has, especially when it's expert content. That's what we're gonna talk about here today. Because I'm not an influencer. My content is not based on how good I look or how funny I am or skits, dances, any of the kind of stereotypes you have there. It is based upon establishing my expertise as someone with experience in marketing, branding, and design. And so we're gonna go step by step through what it takes to develop things like that and the exact tools and stuff I use. So you can walk out of this video with a roadmap to start creating some of those things on your own. So I started on TikTok. And I feel TikTok is a great place to start because it puts your content out there to an audience, whether they know you or not, it will give you views. In your first video, Video, you will have 200 to 500 people that TikTok will show your content to to see if it resonates. And if it does, it will find more people. And I have content that does millions of views. I have content that does a couple thousand views. But basically, even when you develop a large audience, you're essentially starting from scratch with every post. And I posted a lot, posted hundreds of times. At the beginning, I tried to post once a day. Now I try to post five times a week. I've built it into my schedule. We'll get to that in a bit. But as you can see, as I scroll through this, I am doing what's called green screen content on all of this. That means I talk over images. So how do you do this? It all starts with an app called CapCut. CapCut is owned by TikTok. This is the app that you need to use. Whether you have years of experience in Premiere or Final Cut or you've never edited anything at all, this is the app. You use it on your phone. I also use it on desktop. I'll swap into a little desktop view here. There's a video I'm editing right now about packaging. You can kind of see I have a single clip I recorded on my iPhone. I cut out the background and put images behind it. That's basically how this works. But I recommend CapCut because it is so easy and so fast with all the core features you need to make videos and none of the stuff you don't. And the biggest thing is green screen. I use what's called the green screen effect. It's how I talk over those images on video. And you don't need a green screen. I record them right here in the same place I'm recording this YouTube video with a ring light. 
So I use this, it was like a hundred bucks. It's got a diffuser on it on Amazon. The ring light is so crucial that I haul it around essentially everywhere because that lighting is so good. Even when I'm traveling, I'm taking the big ring light because all the smaller ones just haven't been as good. I point it right at my face and I talk and that is the extent of the production. I use an $80 Rode mic that plugs into the lightning port of my iPhone. I don't even have the latest iPhone and everything is recorded on there. This video is on like a pro cam, but all my short form is done on iPhone. So Rode Video Mic Me, that is just a standard big ring light. I think it's newer, that's the brand name. I have an Atomtech tripod that has a little Bluetooth there for when I film myself like walking around or doing things and Bluetooth to your phone so you can hit camera start stop. And that is the extent of the equipment that is involved in this process. To make this easy, I'm going to screen capture CapCut right now and put it on the overlay so you can see exactly how this is done. So I go over here, I go to camera, point the camera at myself. I click effects on the bottom left corner. You're gonna see a little menu, I go to green screen. There are two green screens. There's green screen photo and green screen video. So if you wanna record over a video, you switch it. So photo, you can actually pinch and resize yourself and move yourself all around the screen to decide where you're gonna record at. Video, you're static. So you're gonna have to use your chair or your tripod if you want to record over a video to be able to move yourself and get creative. I do primarily photo. You literally select a photo to record over. I've got this photo here from the Olympics. You record yourself talking, you can speak over it. And then if you hit effects again, it's gonna bring up that effect and you can select another image and talk over your next image. And that is the core of that workflow. That is the important part of that workflow. The reason this format is so impactful is someone just sitting talking at a screen isn't super visually compelling. And you're competing when you make short form with just tons of amazing content and creators and things out there. So you want to be visually compelling. So putting images behind yourself helps it be captivating to tell your story and have images there. I make nine by 16 images for all of these that I'm able to talk over. And that means it's a nice full bleed in the background, no black bars or anything. And I do this in Canva. It's the easiest tool for the job by far. You can go create an Instagram story in Canva, which basically allows you to make slides that are nine by 16 auto sized. Um, you can see here, I have this plant. I use the magic edit on this plant to simply cut it out. If you hit edit image and background remover, it will cut basically anything out there. I put text on these images. You know, if you hit the, the plus side, it will add a new template. I resize larger things to be full nine by 16. I stack images on top of each other. I will go make slides in here that I then talk over in my green screen videos. But that is the flow. I make graphics in Canva. It's a combination of screenshots from the iPhone, images I find on wherever that I'm talking about, things I cut out or edit, all sized to nine by 16. I bring that into CapCut and use the green screen effect. I'm using a ring light. I'm using the Rode mic. I have it on a tripod. That is the end of the logistics. And I want to break that down because that's a lot of the common questions. The number one reason people don't start is they're like, how do you do those videos where your head is floating? What gear do I need? Oh, it's expensive. It's this or that. It's not. It is just those things. And you can try other styles or formats. You can just talk to a camera. You can do vlogs and edits. There's a million types of content you can do. And I've talked about some of those in my personal brand for creatives video. But here I'm really focused on just explaining how you do the basics of that green screen content. So you can see in a video like this, I edited this pretty heavily. I cut all these graphics out and made them all in Canva. I put the captions over them in CapCut. I'm moving around on the screen. It's relatively dynamic and I'm talking about a subject versus something like this where I'm kind of just throwing images up there, editing a few, a few things and talking over them, but I didn't put a bunch of time into the graphic. But this combination of me talking and then putting captions on there, and those captions are auto-generated in CapCut. There's an option to go auto-generate and it will put text up there. You can edit and shorten a certain amount of time is the core of what these videos look like. But I've been making, as you scroll through this, roughly a video a day now for two years. I've turned it into a recurring thing that's a part of my life. And you don't have to go do that and make as much content as I have. And you'll see in some of the other videos I talk about basically just getting into a creative flow where you're putting out a video even every week or two every week. You're recapping some of those videos into an email every quarter. Uh, I've talked about that in previous videos, but it's about establishing a creative rhythm where you're showing your work, you're showing your expertise. And if you want to grow, you do a lot more and you should try to post every day or like five times a week. So how do you organize or know what to talk about? If you look at the things that I'm doing on here, I have reference videos. It's one type. So reference videos is you talk about a bunch of different things. So this is a packaging trends video. I am simply putting together a bunch of references that are worth talking about to show you different types of packages. So if you're a graphic designer, you'll see a popular format for that is people talking about fonts. They'll gather a couple of reference fonts together for you know luxury fashion fonts. This is Brady. He was in a, a previous Cut30 uh, cohort uh, I did and has, has stuck with it really well. But again, he's just putting a reference video together, a bunch of different fonts. This is Jason who crushed this last Cut30. Steal uh, my art director bookmarks. bookmarks.
And this is an example of like, he is literally making all his references public for all his bookmarks, making a video about different tools. But that's the first type of video, it's just a reference video, a compendium of things that other people might find interesting. And it's a great format for creatives to be able to put out there to help enable other people. Now I'm gonna talk about perspective on this and why you should do this, like whether you're an expert or you're new and how you look at that here in a moment. And then there's what I call a story. Video. So this video from Jason is another good example of just a story video. He is telling the story of what someone did. This YouTuber who has a certain design style, certain thumbnails, he is walking through the end to end story of that. One of my first videos I had that did well was very similar. I was talking about the story behind Montclair, which not a lot of people know. And that's literally you are kind of just explaining someone else's story and then adding your input. And then we have playbook content. So Alex does, does tons of playbooks. I started off doing a lot of this. I do a little less of it now, but literally a playbook is like, let's explain a common thing and then give you five or six steps that someone else could follow to do it, to actually explain how something works. And it could be a playbook for whether that's art direction or design or dance or wrestling or whatever it ends up being. It doesn't have to be purely a creative thing. You can basically say, hey, if I want to accomplish a thing, what are five or six things someone should know and then break them down. And then we have idea content. So I do a lot of idea content where you say, what if something could be, how would I do it? Or what's a concept that I'm thinking about that I want to resonate with? So for instance, with this one, I take a scenario and say, hey, if I wanted Lacoste to resonate more with American Gen Z, here's how I would do it. And I put an idea out and I explain the idea. It's another great format of the five I'm gonna talk about here. The last is a comparison or a function. So I did this video this last Sunday. It's about Ala Yoga versus Lululemon, why I like one's better than the other. And this format does really well when you actually put things in perspective and you ask people to make a choice or look at a decision or weigh different factors. Uh, one of the series I I got popular with was called product versus brand where I discuss if you were buying something because it was a good product or buying it for the branding. This concept is called brand battle where I kind of put two brands in front of each other and compare what they're doing well or not. Uh, but things like that where you begin to develop opinions, etc., are really interesting ways that people like to look at and, and reflect on. Those are the five types of content that I feel most expert content falls into one of those buckets and you can use as your guideline. So I'm going to talk a bit about where you're at in the journey and making content because my content has resonated because I'm an expert, right? I wasn't an established expert for people to know who I was, but I've spent 15 plus years designing, marketing, working in teams, working in retail. So I have a lot of expertise to share for people that are in the same shoes as me, but I've seen things a different way, or people who are coming up underneath me who are learning a lot of the things that I've already learned and can benefit from getting to it faster and having someone really simply explain it to them, which is really what my, my skill set is. I can simply and sometimes entertainingly explain them. But no matter where you are in the journey, you can document it. I like to pull Katrina. Now, Katrina is like a, you kind of watched her and her content evolve from, let's say, like a junior or mid-level designer to like a senior designer. And she's kind of documented the whole thing. You know, moving to LA, the different types of designs she does, designs she did in a year. And I like to bring this up. Uh, I love her content because you can actually kind of watch the designs improve and things go on over time. And this is an important concept because it doesn't just apply to design. If you are anything, you are a copywriter, a brand owner, an entrepreneur, a bodybuilder, whatever it is, where you're at is interesting to somebody. Now, the total available market of where you're at may not be huge, but I guarantee you, even if you're just beginning your journey, there is someone else that is beginning their journey who would like to follow along with you and learn how you learn. And so if you are a junior copywriter or you're a junior analyst or whatever it is, your first job, if you show what you learn, what you're good at, what you're struggling with, there are other people who are in that same scenario who are going to learn from that and who are going to engage with you. And again, maybe that's a hundred people, not a hundred thousand people, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. It's about honing that skill set. It's about getting some of that following together. And what I like to say is if you are in a more junior to mid-level part of your career, it's talking about things that you aspire to do or want to learn about or research, things that you're struggling with, things that you've learned that have been valuable, and then cataloging things that are going on in the world around you. One of my friends, Nate, um, I think he's under 30. He runs a newsletter called Express Checkout. He's really interested in the CPG industry, so consumer packaged goods, and he literally just curates the news. I think he, at least at the point when he started this, may not have felt he was at a point in his career to have tons of strong opinions or be giving tons of advice, but instead he said, you know what, I'm going to make one of the most straightforward places where you can go just to get the news about this industry if you care about it aggregated into one place really thoroughly. And I think from this, he has built an audience of people that are from junior level people all the way up to like C-level executives who also want to take advantage of the fact that he's putting the time in to aggregate this and learn from this. And I believe it is a you know, something that will get him hired and intros to tons of people in the future because of what he's built from there. And he does content around the same thing where he'll talk about some of the things he sees inside his newsletter. He has a couple thousand followers. It's not huge. Plenty of videos have done well, but it is a key cornerstone of whatever he wants to do next. He'll have had this newsletter where he aggregates this and he'll have had this content where he's explaining different things that are happening in consumer packaged goods and what he likes about them and not. This helps refine his opinions, engage with him to go into new people and provide a basis for whatever springboard he wants to do professionally or entrepreneurially going forward. And I say all this to say, it doesn't matter where you are. There's an audience for it. It's about documenting the journey where you're at, not trying to be something that you're not. 
and just continuing to make content around. So we talked a bit about the tools and how I do it, talked a bit about the content types, about where you are in your career, how you kind of document that. So how's the actual workflow work to write and create this kind of content? And how do you keep that going week over week, month over month? So I have this Notion doc, it is the Oren Videos Notion doc. And you'll see what I do is I write down ideas. So in this list here is just ideas. So every week as I record content, as I meet people, as I have meetings, as I read things, I put an idea down there. And it can be as simple as like a brand name, like Umbro, Matsuda, packaging, you know, the maximize, the vacation whipped cream, whatever. I'm writing an idea down. And then I start to add bullet points to that idea. And my goal at the end of every week is to have a bullet points on a couple videos that I can turn into. But you'll see, this is a long, long list of videos because ideas is the core of this, but there should be no shortage of them, right? Anytime there's anything interesting or a question or a brand you might want to do a future content piece on, you just simply put the name in there and you begin to flesh it out. Like this Umbro video is not ready yet, but you'll see I started to put bullet points. I put down community, their art director, the viral garments, they did the right collabs, they leveraged existing brand equity. I'm beginning to put together the foundations of what I'm going to talk about versus this Matsuda video that's pretty much ready. I've now scripted out. I have line for line roughly what I'm going to talk about with this and it's not quite ready. I will always have some of these in progress and my goal by the end of each week is to have at least these bullet points for about five videos ready going into the weekend. And then I start writing them out, adding some jokes, and I literally script it line for line. And every one of these lines becomes a graphic that I make in Canva like I showed before. So I will go make a line for this intro for this luxury bucket list idea for this first time I show Mitsuda for the second time. And I now know I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 of these here. I need 12 graphics. I'll get images from the Matsuda website. I'll take some pictures of the Matsudas I just got. You know, again, I'll, you, I'll go look up Umbro, if it was the Umbro content, whatever that ends up being. And I will put all those images together. I will have that script and I will prep multiple videos. And I'll sit down and I'll record them all one at a time, swap some hoodies, whatever it is, or break it up in a couple sessions throughout the day. But this flow where I'm constantly writing down ideas and I'm working on the bullet points and then I then know at the end of any given week, I've got enough bullet points to go into scripts. I make scripts and graphics together and then I record. And then over the week, I will edit them before I post them like every day. So every morning, Morning before I post, I'll finish up an edit for 20 minutes. And that is the flow that has worked really well for me. I think it's a flow that you will probably be able to take some inspo from as well, because that getting that big list of ideas is super important and you can get them online. You can get it from in-person combos, whatever that looks like. I will probably end up doing a whole like references video at some point where I dive really deep into like all the places you can get creative inspiration and where you can keep up with like stuff inside creative niches. But that flow of putting those down and getting into a weekend has allowed me to kind of create this framework where I can create content without having it take up too much of my time. Yes. I spend time on the weekends on it. That's part of it. This is something I do that is a extra income source, right? I still work, I still have brands. Uh, and so there's stuff that like, has to happen where this is always gonna be extra, but I, and able to create and make time because I think it's worthy enough, especially now at my size, where I think it's worth the effort for me to put into it. But for you, wherever point you're at, like I did this while for about 20 of the 24 months, I had a full-time job while I was doing. It. Now I do not have a full-time job. I have a bunch of like part-time things in the brands I have ownership in, but I still prioritize it. But you can do that within, again, your own framework, set your own rules for it. One thing a week, two things a week, five things a week, depending on how much you want to grow. But that's really the toolkit. If you look at what you actually need to record, look at the formats you can use to talk about, look at the perspective of where you can talk about where you are in your career. And you look at tactically how you put those ideas together, how you script them out and how you make a video, like that's the foundation. From this, like my goal is you should really have no excuse if you really want to do it, not to start because all those questions will really have been answered. And there's plenty of little things like, hey, go crop the beginning and end of all your clips so the sound is there or use the Adobe Audio Enhance filter if you want to like make your audio sound perfect. And you know, like there's lots of little tips and tricks you can get, but like you're watching me on YouTube. And I feel like anyone that's on YouTube knows how to answer your questions, right? Every one of these things that I learned, I learned from one of two places. I bought Jimmy Farley, who's another kind of YouTuber creator, he runs Creators Corner. Uh, I bought his like initial TikTok course. He did a TikTok course before he launched Creative Corner. It was like 100, 200 bucks. And I got the basics, very similar to kind of what I put in here. Um, and then I YouTube everything else, literally. How to get cap cut, how to do this, how to do that. And so if you are here watching this, you have the skill set to go YouTube any of the things that I didn't talk about. And the best part about all this is that the networks grow. It happens naturally. Algorithms incentivize new creators and new content. So I'll talk a little bit about the different networks. That's kind of the last thing I'll really hit here. So TikTok, like I mentioned, is great. TikTok, there is a setting on here when you have a new account, you can set where it won't show your stuff to any of your followers. Uh, discover, uh, I think it's discoverability. I'm not hundred percent sure where it, where it is while I'm sitting here on desktop, but there's a setting in there that means that no one who's on your phone will be able to see you with any more likelihood than anybody else. You can deselect. So if you want to test and try things out, TikTok is a great place. No one will ever see it. No one saw my TikTok videos for the first like 40 TikTok videos I made. And just for reference, I like had some mess, messes up before I actually hit it. I started making content. My first idea was to do non-alcoholic drinks because I don't really drink. And I, at that time I didn't drink at all. I was going to review that. I made some videos that weren't very good. I killed that account. Second one, I was going to make an account all about consumer packaged goods and CPG. Two 
niche also wasn't quite right. My third account, I slowed down. I started talking a little bit more about marketing and branding and um, and turned into what it is today, right? And so again, that's fine. You have 40 or 50 videos and no one watches. That's fine. You keep going. You refine it. You get there. But TikTok will serve your content out to people and it will show it from the very beginning and you have just as much of a chance to get views in your first video as your, as your 15th or 20th. Instagram is roughly the same, not quite to the same extent, um, but a lot more work happens on there. Like TikTok, you can get a lot of views, you can get a lot of interest, but like people will hire you, you will find people in your niche and more important people in the, especially in the creative world are on there, but content needs to be a little bit more higher production. But TikTok, you can have more fun. You can try other different formats. You can kind of lean more into some of like the trends and things you see on there. And it's very casual and it's a fun place to grow and experiment and learn. And I feel like if you are a solid creator on there and really learn what you're doing, that really translates well to other networks. Instagram is going to be where you end up getting your core where you make the most money. I'd recommend doing them both roughly at the same time. I didn't go over on, onto Instagram until I already had like 50,000 or so on YouTube, I'm sorry, on TikTok. YouTube Shorts is really mainstream, basically. I don't think it's like a good primary to grow on. Two things about YouTube Shorts. It doesn't have a ton of value and it's very mainstream. So what do I mean by that? So very mainstream and the things that succeed on there are super mainstream ideas. It's like content for everybody. TikTok and Instagram are very good at putting you in your niche. TikTok gets you in a really specific niche. Like if you're really interested in marketing around like localized businesses in California, you'll get content around that. It, sh it shows you what you like at a very niche level. Instagram is better on that kind of broadly. They'll show you design videos, marketing videos, Videos, that kind of thing. You can fall into a broad niche, it ends up being very good, you get a big audience. YouTube is just why, it's just showing that shit to everybody. So if it works, it has to be super mainstream appeal. And the other thing about that is those subscribers aren't super useful. They don't watch your long form content. You can't really do sponsor content to them that succeeds. It doesn't get you a ton of value to build a huge shorts audience. It does potentially if you have like a really specific mainstream brand or going into retail or whatever, but as like a creator or personality, it really only goes so far for you and I'd be better off putting your, your time into long form, just my opinion. But uh, if you wanna post on there anyway, it doesn't take that long and it's helpful. If you are a business person, LinkedIn is really incentivizing video right now. And if you are comfortable posting your content on LinkedIn, even if it's less polished, it's probably gonna do pretty well. And I would say it's a great place to be in video right now. And if you are getting comfortable with the content, I would 100% be posting over there um, as a network where you're included as well. I'm posting all my stuff on there almost every every day with the exception of like less serious content. But the core of your starting is gonna wanna be Instagram. And that's really it. Uh, like, like I've said before, um, I do a program on content creation, Cut30. If you are like a college student or you're junior in your career or whatever it is, like I will say this 100 times, don't ever buy anything that I have. It's not for you. Do all the free stuff I said. And, uh, if you are mid-level or you're in your career and you're trying to advance it and you want like a fast, done by a professional way to do stuff, I make that I make solutions for that. Uh, and Cut30 is great for that. You can, it's, we have a 30 day bootcamp where you actually do all this content like with accountability. The next one launches like August 13th. So anyway, drop any questions you have around this before here. I will probably do like a follow up to this, like going pro or something like that in like a month or two if people are interested. Um, but let me know questions about that process or any of the content that I've made. And I hope this was valuable and I hope it gets you started on that journey because I do feel like wherever you're at in your creative career, putting some of the time to understanding how these networks move and then doing it um, is really worth the time.